Today we're going to be continuing in our study of uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 14. And we'll start with our study of the book of Matthew, chapter 14, by uh, reading Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, listen to this. Finally, brothers, listen, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's very convicting to me. I've known these words, you know, since high school. And I've loved these words. They often come to my mind. And yet, and yet, when I'm not focusing on Jesus, when I'm not really trying, Remember we said that relationships are riding a bicycle uphill? As long as you keep pushing, you're going to be working on that relationship. But as soon as you think, well, I've arrived, I'm okay, what happens? The bike slides down the hill. And when we're not working on our relationship with our spouses or with our, or with our God, uh, we can slide down that hill. And uh, it's very easy for me to park in a bad place where I can uh, pout, I can feel sorry for myself, I can be bitter, angry, disappointed, upset, and I can park my mind in places like that. The Bible says anything that's true, noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, anything is excellent or praiseworthy, we're supposed to think about these things. And I used to talk to people about the record that's playing in your mind or the tape. I don't, you know, now we got to talk about what? MP3s. What's MP3 stand for anyways? See, it doesn't even make sense. <laughs> so, what's going on in your mind? What are we playing again and again? What's uh, being repeated? Because when I read that, it sounds good. Nobody in here thought, well, yeah, right. I don't want to think about all those good things. It sounds good, but it's not natural to me. I'm talking about my fallen self. Not the self that God's given me, my new self, but my fallen self, this is not natural to me. Sometimes an honest reading of my heart would be, whatever isn't working out, that's what I'm fixated on. Whatever bills have to be paid, that's what's filling my mind. Whoever is being unfair or disrespectful, oh yeah. You ever been there? Boy, that person isn't treating me with the dignity that I deserve, you know? What are we filling our minds with? Whatever trials, fears, concerns I have, overwhelmed by these, overwhelmed by these. That doesn't even sound good. You know, the first one sounds good, the second one did not sound good, but where do we naturally park if we're not pushing, if we're not turning our heart and our mind over to the Lord? all the time. Today's sermon title is What's Your Focus? What's Your Focus? What are we fixating our, ourselves upon? Because not a person in here doesn't have a ton of things to worry about. Oh, but you don't know, Pastor, I've got this and this and this and this. Yeah. And this person has that and that and that and that. And you don't know. And this person back there, you don't know, but they've got this and this and this and this. We've all got things to think about and worry about and be concerned about. In this life, when are we going to put Christ in the middle? Well, when my life gets together and I don't have so many problems. Oh, well, how long are you going to wait? How long have you been waiting? This life, at best, is a foretaste, right? Like a hors d'oeuvre. Gainesville's a pretty nice place. It's not heaven. It actually, I know it's hard for you to believe, it actually gets better than this. God has wonderful, wonderful things in store for us. And in this life, in this fallen world, with our fallen selves, surrounded by fallen people, we can't wait. So there's nothing going on here, nothing going on out there, until all of our problems and situations are solved before we start putting Christ in the middle. Otherwise, we'll be waiting forever. Why is it easier to find reasons 
to feel like you're mistreated. Remember we said that a person when they feel ill-used is capable of anything? If you think you're ill-used, people aren't respecting you enough, treating you well, you're capable of all sorts of nastiness. Why is it that it's so easy to find reasons to feel like you're being mistreated? Why is it easy to make a list of things that you don't like in other people? Well, I don't like when they do this, okay? And I don't like when they do that, okay? You know, God sees that too. And he probably doesn't like your attitude right now. Well, what about them? What? Do you trust God to deal with them? I mean, either they're not saved and they're going to go to hell, which in case God dealt with them, or they have the Holy Spirit of God, they're his servant, who are you to judge another man's servant, and guess what? He says they're going to stand. They're going to be okay. God began a good work in you, he's not going to give up on you. And that person that you're listing all those things you can't stand about, guess what? He's not giving up on them either. And one day, we will stand in paradise and all the baggage and all the hard-headedness and the nastiness is just going to be gone. And we'll look at one another and we'll smile full of joy. And there's not going to be any of that shadow or any of that. Because we'll both know I'm forgiven. And you're forgiven. And we're here because of the blood of Jesus Christ. God's not giving up. God doesn't divorce his children. And God's not going to divorce you. Uh, or that person that you ticked off at. Why is it easier to complain and pout than to give thanks and rejoice? Now, a bitter person is never a joyful, a joy-filled Christian, right? And it's actually impossible to be a thankful Christian and be ruled by bitterness. If my heart is ruled by all these reasons to, to give glory to God, to be thankful to God, it's impossible for me uh, to have bitterness as my idol. To what's at the center of my life, what I'm worshiping. Today's title, remember, what's your focus? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look at his wonderful face. And then what happens to the cares of this world? They grow strangely dim. Life seems overwhelming at times. Uh, so many times I've been in counseling, and people, uh, people say, "Oh, I can't cope with life right now. It's too much for me." Boom, 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 boom. And then I want to talk to them about your relationship with God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that church stuff, but you got to help me with my problems. See, everybody has problems, but what am I looking at? What am I focused on? Because in this life, Christ said, you will have trouble. Now, the televangelist says no, Jesus says yes. I'm going to go with Jesus on this one. Uh, so in this life, we will have trouble. So what, what are we surprised about? Why are we so shocked when hard times come, when there's financial trouble, health issues, relational difficulties? And then we sit around and say, why is my life, why is my life, why is my life, instead of putting Christ right at the middle, focusing on Jesus Christ, and then understanding, you know, all this is passing. And I want to glorify God in this situation. I don't have to give thanks for everything. My dog died, hallelujah. But I can give thanks in every situation. Because hard times are going to be part of this life. Everybody has trouble. We have trouble because we live in a fallen world. We have trouble because we're nasty and messed up and we bring a lot of hardship on ourselves. We're, we have trouble because the people around us are struggling. And broken people do broken things. Should not surprise us. And then, guess what? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the added blessing of having trouble because some people won't understand your faith. Your boss, boss may not like it. Your family may not like it. Your friends might think there's something wrong with you. And your neighbors might say, hey, wait a second. They're at church every Sunday morning. I can take the lawnmower. Uh, so we have, we have the troubles that everybody else has. And then there are troubles that you'll be able to encounter and experience just because you've given your heart to Jesus Christ. There are times in our lives, this I get overwhelmed. I don't even know what whelm is. I know what overwhelm is, but I've always wondered what a whelm is because... I'm not sure I'm feeling whelmed today or overwhelmed. Just a little whelmy, maybe. <laughs> when you feel overwhelmed, sometimes it's hard to even breathe. 
sometimes it's hard to get motivation to go up a flight of stairs. When you feel overwhelmed, when you feel overwhelmed, it's hard to choose Coke or Pepsi, <laughs> McDonald's or, or a Burger King. When you feel overwhelmed, it seems like even the smallest choice is just beyond your capability. Like, oh, what am I going to do? What am I supposed to do in this situation? Friday was uh, going on like any other day. Had a good time. Take the kids to school. My poor daughter, Megumi, has been up from about 8 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the morning, day after day after day, working on math, uh, trying to get her assignments done. Working on that. We have Sean and Elaine staying with us. Wonderful, wonderful house guests. Doing a lot of Bible studies, a lot of prayer. And then uh, I got a call from Mom, and you knew right away it was that call. And then your, mind, your mind goes so fast. I thought, this is the call that I've never wanted to hear all my life. And Mom's crying. She's scared. And she says, uh, Daniel, come, come fast. Dad fell off the stairs, and he's not moving. And uh, she said, I already called the ambulance. So I got in the car and uh, went safely, but very fast through town. And uh, I felt like my world dropped out from underneath me. And I knew I can't drive too emotional. And I also knew I didn't have all the facts. But Mom was very scared. Dad wasn't moving. So I thought, oh boy, I should have told her to pump his chest. I'm, I can't do that. I'm driving right now. <clears throat> and uh, things just go through your mind so fast. I'm thinking uh, how I, my dad is one of my best friends. You know, Yumi is my best friend, but my dad is one of my very best friends that I've got. I thought, I do not want to pastor this church alone. Uh, John was saying this morning, he says, I bet most people don't know how much your dad does behind the scenes. And I really believe that. Uh, Yumi is another one. Uh, working so hard, many, many hours behind the scenes. Nobody knows what dad's, they just see Dan up here. They don't know how much dad does to keep, to keep this church going, working in people's lives, uh, counseling, being a friend. And I'm thinking, I, I don't want to pass this church alone. I'm thinking, I, I hate to lose my dad. Felt like that kind of tightness breath, you know, but I said, Lord. And, and I was praying, God, uh, help us, help our family to deal with this in a way that can glorify you. Help the church to get through this in a way that's glorify you. And I was just outside the hospital and then, oh yeah, God, and heal him too, you know. I, not the hospital, I was going home. And so I pull up. The, the street where my folks live at, and paramedics are out there, and they're both over Dad, near his chest, and uh, parked car, ran up there, Mom's crying, and uh, but Dad's awake, and he's, he's moving, but in a lot of pain, he's really red, and he's saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, and they're, they're putting this neck brace on him and everything, and he had fallen off our front porch, which is fairly high, you know, fallen completely backwards, hit his head on the sidewalk, and uh, give mom a hug. I knew as I was driving up there and as I saw my dad on the ground, this is either the day that I never want to have happen or it's practice for it. Because it's coming. If the Lord Jesus doesn't come back and take his church in our lifetimes, everybody in this room, Gonna, every love story in this life ends in tears. The person you love most, unless you both go, boom, together, which I'm not advocating for nuclear war, but <laughs> unless you both go together, those days come, and they're sad, and they're lonely, and they're empty. Why do you want to even prepare food anymore? Why get up? Why take shower? Because God did a wonderful thing when he made the two one, and now it's been ripped asunder, and it's hard. So I'm loving my dad, and I'm seeing him on the ground, and I, I always hate seeing my dad uh, weak, and I never saw my dad like this. I remember growing up, I didn't like it when I could start to carry things and open things that dad couldn't. Didn't like it at all. 
because Dad was always larger than life for me. And to see Dad hurting there on the ground was hard for me. Uh, we uh, got Dad to the hospital and uh, they did a bunch of tests. And Dad's fallen three times just in the last couple months. Downstairs, inside, off the back porch. And both those times he got bruises and, and scrapes. So this time he, he did it. He got five broken ribs and uh, partially deflated lung. Uh, but I'd like him to find out why Dad's fallen. But uh, I've tried to say the right things. Dad had a, you know, you want to say something comforting and wise. So Dad was trying to give away some some uh, tickets to a fair, to a to a show, Oliver. To and we could go because we had the girls Bible club mini at our house. They gave it to Dad. So I said, Dad, I want some of your stuff too. But, uh, which made him laugh, which made his chest hurt more. Uh, but then Dad was talking, and we were talking about the children's fair, and he said, uh, I'm supposed to go help out at the children's fair, but now I get to watch the Badger game. And Dad said, the Lord works in strange ways. <laughs> and so I came back to Dad the next day, and I said, Dad, that was a brilliant plan. Except the game doesn't start till 9.30 at night. I said, you did this and you wasted it. You didn't even have to do it. Uh, went up there today and uh, yesterday I wasn't happy with that situation because he was worse than the, the evening of the day it happened. But I think that was all the drugs they had in him. But today he was sitting up in his chair and they were going to keep him one night. And now it looks like they're going to keep him three nights and hopefully they figure out what's going on. But Dad's looking better today. And I left the hospital feeling good. Guess what? I had Dad pray for our church service this morning. So Pastor Dave was praying for us in the church service, uh, even though he couldn't attend here this morning. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 14, from verse 22 to 33. Did you notice? I didn't have, when I was driving that car, I didn't have to do something legalistic like, oh, I have to pray. I need to get in my daily prayer time. When Christ is the center of our lives, it's very natural to turn to Him. It's very natural to turn to Him. I didn't have to tell myself to pray. I was just praying my whole way over there. And uh, while I'm talking with Dad, while I'm preaching to you guys, uh, praying. Praying all the time. Okay, chapter 14 from verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples, so this is immediately after he feeds the 5,000, he had that message show. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Now remember, remember John the Baptist got his head cut off because that gal was doing a little dance routine? So he got his head cut off, and Jesus wanted to go in a, into a solitary place to pray, but all the crowds followed him. And he had such a heart of compassion, he didn't say, come on, people, I need some private time right now. Instead, uh, he went out and tried to bless and love people, uh, even while he was uh, going through a difficulty of losing uh, John the Baptist. And so now he sent the people away, he sent the disciples across the uh, Sea of Galilee, which is not a big sea, by the way, and he goes up on a mountainside by himself to pray. He wants to get alone so he can spend time with his Heavenly Father. And remember, we have the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So people say, uh, why does Jesus pray to God if he's God? Not understanding that what is prayer? Prayer is not magic and it's not hocus pocus. Prayer is when we talk to our loving Heavenly Father. He loves us, he wants to hear from us. In the Trinity, they have this eternal love relationship. The Father is seen as saying, this is my beloved Son, you know. Uh, listen to him. Uh, when Jesus talks to God, when God talks to Jesus, you can call it prayer if you want. But it's within the Trinity, this communication, this love uh, communication going on. And we are invited into that. We are given the right to enter this relationship with God. That's what we're created for, to commune with God and to pray. 
So we need to stop thinking of prayer as some burdensome thing that we have to do and start realizing what a wonderful thing we're invited into the intimacy of the Trinity. We get to share in this love relationship. We get to talk with God the Father. What a beautiful and wonderful thing. And uh, what a joy to know that we can always turn to God no matter what we're going through. So Jesus gets alone on the mountainside to pray. When evening came, so he's up on the mountain, you can probably see the disciples out on the boat. When evening came, he was alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by waves, because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, so the boat's been out there all night. This is a small, we call it Sea of Galilee, it's like a lake. They should have been across a long time ago. And if they couldn't make it across, they should have turned around and come back. They couldn't go either way. The storm was keeping them from progressing. They couldn't go forward, they couldn't go back. Shortly before dawn, uh, your Bible might see the fourth watch, or your Bible may see, say, between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock. I wonder if it's already starting to get a little light so they can see a little better. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples uh, saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, or maybe your Bible says, be of good cheer. I like that. It is I. He's literally saying, I am. Take courage, I am, uh, which might be a reference back to the burning bush, right? Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. I wonder if Jesus smiled when he said that. I also wonder, this is totally unimportant, I wonder if Jesus kind of surfing on the top of the waves, you know, or if the waves would just roll around him, but he was always on a flat surface. But see, you're in this boat, and it's rocking to the point where you can't make progress, and Peter's there, and he says, I want to get out. I wonder if he tried to get out, and the water dipped down, he couldn't go down, and the water came up and punched him back up, or what the situation was, but he gets across, he's out of the boat, He's looking at Jesus Christ. Jesus says, come. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked out in the water. I wonder if he just cried with joy. Like, whoa, whoa. But I the other apostles are all watching this. There's Jesus. And he's walking on the water. Remember we said that book by John Orford? If you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. You've got to get out of the boat. Take a step of faith. Peter, Peter got down out of the boat walked on the water, came to Jesus, but when he saw the wind. Now, I've heard pastors make a big deal about this. He didn't see the waves, he saw the wind. I don't even know what that means. I've never seen wind in my life. Uh, when you see trees billow, I, I think you're seeing the wind. That's the same when you see water billow, you're seeing the wind. So uh, you don't see the wind, you, you, you see what the wind does to the waves and to the, the clouds and the trees and things. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. You notice, nobody had to tell him, brother, you ought to pray. <laughs> he knew Jesus was the one to talk to. And he instinctively said, Lord, save me. This was, a lot of times we focus on the fact that he was sinking. We're going to get to that. I think it's beautiful. In, uh, J. Virgin McGee said, if this was a pastor who fell in the water, he would have said, Thou omnipotent God, who art Lord of heaven and earth, <laughs> please in thy goodness condescend to reach down and pick me. You know, he didn't have to go through all that big spiritual language. He just said, Lord, save me. And that's beautiful. And when you find yourself at the end of your rope, and you're being overwhelmed, and the sea is buffeting into you, life is hard. Maybe you're just so fed up with yourself. Why am I such an ordinary person? Why am I so difficult? Why, why am I lying? And we just reach out and say, God, you've got to save me because I don't have any hope here, and I'm not going to be able to save myself. Remember those old uh, Looney Tunes cartoons? You, you, you'd run off the cliff, and you'd fall down, and you'd go in the water. You know what they would do? They're in the water. They'd grab their own hair, and they'd pull themselves up out of the water. We can't do that because of sin. We'll drown. And there's no way we can pull ourselves out. We need somebody who's not in the mess we're in. We need somebody who can walk on that water. Who's not overwhelmed by life. Who can reach down and he says, Lord, save me. And he reaches down and grabs us and he pulls us right out of the water. Brothers and sisters, when life is hard, when you're scared, when you're driving to that hospital, 
It's a time to start talking to God. And don't make your prayer beautiful and flowery. Talk from your heart to his heart. Be real. We've got a real God. Why cover him and make him fuzzy with all the fluff? Peter got out of the boat, walked in the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. When he saw the storm, he started to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why do you doubt? And when they, cli when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. When those who were in the boat, then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Uh, we've said this many times. Did you ever have a favorite teacher in school? Or maybe a coach, track coach, or football coach, tennis instructor? <coughs> it's okay to really like a good teacher. Somebody's really invested in your life. In fact, I would say go back and tell them that they made a difference in your life. I just did that with a teacher recently. Do not fall on your knees and worship your good math teacher. This is only acceptable if this is the living God standing before you. You don't worship anybody but the living God. When they crossed over the land, they were at Gisenaret, and then the men of that place recognized Jesus. They sent word to all the surrounding country. People were brought there sick to him and begged him to let uh, the sickness touch the edge of his cloak, and those who touched him were healed. And so Jesus is right back in the thickest things. He had time to pray, get along with God, and now he's right back in to blessing people. Have you ever noticed uh, when we read the Gospels that sometimes the apostles don't come off looking so good? Isn't that funny? He said the mighty men of God, the apostles, filled with doubt. The apostles saying, oh, it's a ghost. The apostles saying, oh, now we get it. You're in command of the wind. You're God. It may be that was also echoing back to Genesis again when he calms the storm. We see that when the Spirit of God was over the uh, surface of the earth, placed the waters, you can go here, you can go no farther. God is controlling nature. Right here again we see God is controlling nature. Jesus is, is God. But who wrote the book of Matthew? Difficult, difficult. Who wrote the book of Matthew? Matthew. So who is being honest about their struggles and their lack of faith? It's the apostles themselves, and that's really neat. They were incredibly honest about their own shortcomings. They didn't try to make themselves look super spiritual, super religious, because that wouldn't have helped us. Brothers and sisters, let's be honest with others about our relationship with the Lord, too, and about our own struggles. Because if we pretend to be something we're not, then people who are honestly struggling are going to think, boy, I could never get together like so-and-so, like this person. They were honest about their struggles and their journey of faith. They were humble. They didn't believe. Jesus said, you have little faith. I'm thinking if I wrote that story, I wouldn't want to tell the entire world for generations to come, a billion people perhaps, to read that I had little faith. Jesus, can we just skip that part where we're writing this down? How about, how about I just put in, and Jesus said, boy, you guys are awesome. <laughs> Write that in there instead. You notice that in the Bible, King David shown with all his weakness. King Solomon, all his weakness. Job, a righteous man, imperfect. Moses, not allowed into the promised land. You notice that? In the Bible, one perfect hero is Jesus Christ. It's God himself. This book is not here to glorify you or me or any human breathing in here. This book glorifies God. God would love us enough to work with us in our mess. Brothers and sisters, have you ever felt whelmed, whelmy, or overwhelmed? The storm is coming to your life. Things are not making sense. Things are confusing. You thought you were on solid ground and it's falling away underneath you and you don't know where you can stand. You don't know where you're going to go next. It's the time to say, Lord, save me. It's time to look up to heaven. And Peter, Peter had faith to step out. But you know, when he looked at all his tr troubles, what happened to him? Brothers and sisters, think about everything that's good. I don't do this enough. And when I don't, I sink. 
If you're going to focus on the people in the church that kind of get you, if you're going to focus on the things that bother you about your wife or your husband, if you're going to focus on the situation in Syria, the Middle East, if you're going to focus on the situation in the inner city, I mean, we need to be aware. But if that's our focus and we're just fixated, focused on the own darkness within our hearts, I'm just so are you going to have any hope? Are you going to have any joy? Are you going to have any peace? I once had a, a businessman pray to accept the Lord into his heart. I didn't see him for a year after that. I tried to contact him. Finally, one day he comes to church and he is angry. He's ready to fight off the nails, you know. He's, and he had not been that kind of guy. Before. Whoa. You lied to me. I said, why? Because you said I would have this this better relationship. You said I would I would find my life and everything. It, I said, wait a second. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Are you going to church? Are you reading your Bible? Do you love him? No? Then why would you expect to have any of the blessings that come from intimacy with the Lord? When we look at our problems, listen, we gotta get this. Because we know it up here, we gotta get it in here. When we look at our problems, why should we expect peace? When we look at, at the difficulties and troubles, how do we expect not to be overwhelmed and start to sink down? We need to keep our focus on our good God, our good King. Listen, He loved us, He died for us, and not even death is strong enough to separate us from His love. Nothing is strong enough to separate us from His love. No matter what you're going through, don't be confused. This life is not heaven. No matter what you're going through, if we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, if we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, and remember how the story ends, because we have the end of the book, we turn right to the end, and we see it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. Everybody who is in Jesus Christ, because he's not going to let one person escape from his hands. Sisters, Brothers, life is hard. Let's hold on tight to Jesus and and let's uh, work hard at being an encouragement and blessing to one another. Sound good? Right. Lord God, we want to look at your son. And we don't want to be filled with dark thoughts about other people. We don't want to fixate on our own sin. You died for that sin. You took care of it. And it's a lack of faith, Lord, for us to wallow in it. And Lord, we know that this world is a world of tears and death. There's no hope here. If there was, you wouldn't have come. You wouldn't, we wouldn't have that cross. Lord, you are our hope. You are our strength. You are our strong fortress. You are everything we need. You are life. You are love. And Father, we want to we want to be enveloped and wrapped in your grace and your love. Father, I pray for everybody in this room. Pray for my dad, you, me at home, all the others who could come this morning, Lord. Help us to truly believe that you love us. Help us to truly believe that your ways are so much higher and better than our miserable, ornery, self-righteous, hard-headed, greedy, lustful ways, Lord. You're beautiful in everything you do, Lord. And we don't want to look at the storm. We don't want to look at the darkness. We want to see you. Help us, Lord, to walk with you, whether we're walking through deserts or walking on water, Lord. Thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you, sing to you, and study your word. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us and then rose again. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church. For the rest of this message and other full messages, find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. 
Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.